behalf of the Cathedral Chapter and Governing Body of Christ Church, it is a great joy to welcome you to the Cathedral and College Chapel for Choral Evensong and the installation of Canon Professor Sarah Foote as Dean. At the end of the service, we trust for dry weather for a drinks reception in the Cathedral Garden. Please make your way smoothly through the narrow northwest door of the cathedral. And given our numbers, it is important to add on this occasion that if there is a fire alarm during the service, please keep very calm and follow the instructions of the vergers as we make an orderly exit from the cathedral. Now, to adapt the words of William Penn, a former member of this house, amidst the rush and noise of life, we come to be still and wait before God. We pray for his good presence in our business and his blessing on the ministry of Sarah. O oh Lord, open thou our lips. God, make speed to save us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost.
from the book of Job, 28th chapter. Surely there is a mine for silver and a place of gold to be refined. Iron is taken out of the earth and copper is smelted from ore. Miners put an end to darkness and search out to the farthest bound the ore in gloom and deep darkness. They open shafts in a valley away from human habitation. They are forgotten by travellers. They sway suspended, remote from people. As for the earth, out of it comes bread, but underneath it is turned up as by fire. Its stones are the place of sapphires, and its dust contains gold. That path no bird of prey knows, and the falcon's eye has not seen it. The proud wild animals have not trodden it. The lion has not passed over it. They, the miners, put their hand to the flinty rock and overturn mountains by the roots. They cut out channels in the rocks, and their eyes see every precious thing. The sources of the rivers they probe, hidden things they bring to light. But where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place? of understanding. Mortals do not know the way to it, and it is not found in the land of the living. The deep says, it is not in me, and the sea says, it is not with me. It cannot be bought for gold, and silver cannot be weighed out as its price. It cannot be valued in the gold of Ophir, in precious onyx or sapphire, Gold and glass cannot equal it, nor can it be exchanged for jewels of fine gold. No mention shall be made of coral or of crystal. The price of wisdom is above pearls. The chrysolite of Ethiopia cannot compare with it, nor can it be valued in pure gold. Where, then, does wisdom come from? And where is the place of understanding? It is hidden from the eyes of all living and concealed from the birds of the air. Abaddon and Death say, we have heard a rumour of it with our ears. God understands the way to it. And he knows its place. For he looks to the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heaven when he gave to the wind its weight and apportioned out the waters by measure, when he made a decree for the rain and a way for the thunderbolt, then he saw it and declared it. He established it and searched it out. And he said to humankind, truly, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. Here ends the first lesson. an enormous sense of pleasure that we install Sarah as Dean this evening. Her brief biography in the Order of Service recounts the facts of her credentials for this position through her 
academic excellence, her leadership experience, and her deep knowledge of Christchurch in both a lay and ordained capacity. We will shortly hear confirmation of her suitability for this position through the letter's patent, the confirmation of governing body, and the blessing of God through the Bishop of Oxford. What it does not reveal is her passion for every aspect of our foundation, which is school, college, and cathedral. Nor does it highlight her own sense of vocation to this ministry. The respect with which she is held within and far beyond the foundation, and the love and courage with which she exercises her ministry. It is indeed a great joy to welcome and install Sarah this evening. Mr. Subdi, we present to you Sarah Rosamond Irvin Foote, priest, Master of Arts, and Doctor of Philosophy, that by virtue of His Majesty's letters patent, she may be admitted into the office and dignity of Dean in this foundation. Thank you. Let the letters patent of His Majesty the King be read. Charles III. <coughs> by the grace of God of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and our other realms and territories King, Head of the Commonwealth, Defender of the Faith. To all to whom these presents shall come, greeting, know ye that we, of our special grace, certain knowledge, and mere motion, have given and granted, and by these presents for us, our heirs and successors, do give and grant unto our trusty and well-beloved Sarah Rosamond Irvin Foote, Clark in Holy Orders, Master of Arts, Doctor of Philosophy, Canon Residentiary in our Cathedral Church of Christ in Oxford, in the Diocese of Oxford, the place and dignity of Dean of our said Cathedral Church, void by the resignation of our trusty and well-beloved Martin William Percy, Clark in Holy Orders, Bachelor of Arts, Doctor of Philosophy, Master of Education, lately Dean thereof, and in our gift in full right. And her, the said Sarah Rosman Irvin Foote, Dean of our said Cathedral Church, we do make, ordain, and constitute by these presents to have, hold, and enjoy the said place and dignity to the said Sarah Rosamond Irvin Foote, together with all the rights, profits, privileges, advantages whatsoever to the same belonging or appertaining. Commanding by these presents for us, our heirs and successors, firmly enjoining and requiring the chapter and canons or any others whomsoever having or that shall have sufficient power and authority in this behalf, that they admit the said Sarah Rosmond Irvin Foote to the said place and dignity, and that they institute and invest her dean thereof with all rights, members, and appurtenances thereto belonging, and that they do and perform all and singular the things that shall be in any wise fit and necessary to be done in this behalf. In witness whereof, we have caused these, our letters, to be made patent, witness ourselves at Westminster the first day of July in the first year of our reign, by warrant under the King's sign manual. Have the necessary oaths and declarations been made? <laughs> they have. Members of the governing body of this house, 
We have heard that His Majesty the King has approved the appointment of Sarah Rosamond Irvin Foote as Dean of this Foundation. Is it your will that she take up this service? Bishop Stephen, we present to you Sarah Rosamond Irvin Foote to be installed by us as Dean of this Cathedral Church and we ask that you will commend her to our prayers and give her your blessing. I am very happy to do so. Brothers and sisters in Christ, Sarah Rosamond Irvin Foote has been duly appointed as Dean. Therefore, I ask you all, will you uphold her by your prayers, contribute to the welfare of this house, and in so far as you are able, share with her in the propagating of the kingdom of God. With, with the help of God, we will. Almighty God, by whose grace alone we are accepted and called into your service, strengthen your servant Sarah, that she may fulfill the vocation to which you have called her, and may prove to those to whom she ministers an instrument of your love, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not, your God shall come. And the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. In the habitation of dragons there shall be grasses, with reeds and rushes. By virtue of this mandate and the authority thereby committed to me, I install you as Dean of this Cathedral Church. By your authority and example, may you show forth the glory of God and diligently sustain and nourish the body of Christ his Church in this place, and that you may fulfill his will may God ever bestow upon you the grace of his Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth forevermore. Amen. May I invite the Vice-Chancellor and other representatives to extend their work. As Vice-Chancellor, 
and a former official student at this great college, it gives me great and particular pleasure on behalf of the entire Collegiate University to welcome and congratulate the Reverend Canon Professor Foot Sarah as Dean of Christchurch. We send our love and prayers for a successful tenure and we look forward to supporting you and working alongside you in your new role as we take this great collegiate university forward. Welcome and congratulations once again. In the name of God, the gracious and ever merciful, may peace be with you. I am Councillor Lubna Arshad, currently serving as the Lord Mayor of Oxford. Today I am honoured to stand before you as a pioneer for equal representation, having made history as the first woman of colour, the first Muslim woman with an intersectional background and the youngest Lord Mayor to represent our remarkable city. This accomplishment is not only personal significant, but it also marks a significant stride towards promoting diversity, inclusivity and representation in leadership positions. <clears throat> the role of Mayor of Oxford and later on Lord Mayor was traditionally reserved for men. From its inception in 1205 until 1965, when Florence Kathleen Lower shattered the barriers, female Lord Mayors like myself were given the opportunity to serve the city. Although it's taken over 800 years for this change to occur within the council, and a mere 500 years at Christ Church, we can take pride in being witnesses to this moment. I extend my hand in sisterhood to Professor Foote as she leads the way for change. May the future of Christ Church, its students, staff and congregation flourish under her capable guidance. Thank you. As the Lord Lieutenant of Oxfordshire and on behalf of the High Sheriff of Oxfordshire, who unfortunately is ill this evening, we extend our greetings and our great pride, and we look forward to many years of working together with you. On behalf of the churches of the Deanery of Oxford, lay and ordained people of God scattered across our great city, we welcome you, Sarah, with great joy, and we offer you all our love, our prayers and support this day and onwards. Madam Dean, may I, on behalf of the governors, staff, parents and pupils of your cathedral school, send you our very best wishes, prayers and love on this most happy of occasions. Over the many years that you have been at Christ Church, you have cherished and nurtured your school, taking to heart the interests of the youngest members of this foundation, namely the children of our school. May God be with you as you both serve this house with honour, integrity and humility, and as you continue to act as an example and inspiration to the school in its work of following the precepts of the Venerable Bede to teach faith, stir up hope, and pour out love. Amen. Let us all express our shared welcome by saying together, the Lord, Lord prosper you. you. We, we wish, wish you good luck in the name of the Lord. We welcome you.
letter to the Hebrews, the 11th chapter, beginning at the 32nd verse. And what more should I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured, refusing to accept release in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others suffered mocking and flogging, and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, persecuted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. Yet all these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Here ends the second lesson.
God. The Father Thy mercy upon us. And grant us thy salvation. O Lord, save the King. And mercifully hear us when we call upon thee. And you, thy ministers, with righteousness. in our time, O oh Lord. Because there is no other that fighteth for us, but only God. O oh God, may clean our hearts within us. of this world may be so peaceably ordered by thy governance 
that thy church may joyfully serve thee in all godly quietness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. O oh God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works do proceed, give unto thy servants that peace which the world cannot give, that both our hearts may be set to obey thy commandments, and also that by thee, we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may pass our time in rest and quietness. Through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Light in our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord, and by thy great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of thy only Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ.
in the name of the living God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Mounting this pulpit, I feel at least as nervous as I did when delivering my very first sermon here. Then, at a service of Matins on a cold winter morning, the congregation was very small. Today, I am immensely touched and more than a little overwhelmed that so many of you have come to mark this occasion or are watching online. I am indeed surrounded by a veritable cloud of witnesses. I know that you will all assist and support me in running with perseverance the particular race that is set before me and keep my sight fixed on Jesus the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. When I first preached, as now, I had history on my mind and the weight of responsibility of being the first woman in an historic role. Then I reflected on a figure from the distant past, one whose role involved reading and teaching, praying, preaching and ministering as well as high-level administration, the Mercian princess Frithersweave, known in modern English as Frideswide. Having escaped an unwanted marriage, Frithersweave established a religious community on or near this site. She led her congregation in worship and the search for wisdom and understanding while running their affairs and their landed estates. As a new member of the prayerful community at the heart of Christchurch in 2007, I found it profoundly humbling to reflect that prayer had first been uttered here by women and by lay women, some of whom, like me, had once known something of the world, of marriage and of family life. Even more humbling, is the thought that it is about 1,200 years since a woman was last in charge. <laughs> Frideswide is just one of many figures from Christchurch's long past commemorated in this building and its cloister. People whose faithful, prayerful witness to the gospel continue to serve as examples and models for us today. Among the 350 or so memorials are several to past canons, including previous holders of the chair that I've just laid aside, and to many of the 45 deans who preceded me. Some of those had previously ministered as canons, most recently Cuthbert Simpson, who was Regis Professor of Hebrew before becoming dean in 1959. Two of my predecessors in the Ecclesiastical History Chair were later deans, but neither of them here. A.P. Stanley, Dean Stanley, went from Christchurch to Westminster, and the philosopher Henry Mansell became Dean of St. Paul's. This building also bears witness. It reflects shifts in architectural and ecclesiological fashions over the centuries. The unusual design of the nave, chancel and transepts built between 1160 and 1200 ingeniously attempts to create a sense of height by using a so-called giant order elevation. The columns rise up over two storeys, encompassing both nave and gallery above under one overarching arch. Only a few other surviving churches Tewkesbury, Rumsey and Jedburgh abbeys use the same technique. This is often seen as the last expression of Norman architecture before its replacement with the pointed arches and slender columns of Gothic forms. Just one stained glass window now testifies to another innovative period, this time in the 1630s, when the Laudian Dean, Brian Dupper, tried to create the beauty of holiness in a major reordering of the building. Sadly, much of his work, including a new organ, was ripped out during the Protectorate. 
of the three splendid windows that he had commissioned from the Dutch glassmaker Abraham van Linger, only one survives, the Jonah window at the end of the North Isle. When a decree in 1651 ordered the removal from church windows of all glass depicting God, good or bad angels or saints, an outspoken Puritan canon, Henry Wilkinson, appointed to the chapter by Parliament, jumped on the glass as the windows were taken from the stonework, shattering them into fragments. It's helpful to think about the history of Christchurch across the long durée, to see in the fabric of the building and its monuments the palimpsest of earlier centuries. There have been periods in the past when the institution has gone through extremely difficult times, but it has always recovered and restored itself. Everyone here is aware that Christchurch is just emerging from a notably painful period. Many who care deeply about this place have found the events of recent years profoundly distressing. Yet we too shall recover and restore ourselves. The Governance Review presents us with exciting opportunities to fashion Christchurch afresh, preserving our unique status as both a college and a cathedral under a different sort of leadership and with some new internal structures. I'm proud and honoured to play a part in this process. The readings for tonight were those prescribed by the lectionary, but those of you who know me well will appreciate how deliberate were the choices made about tonight's music, from the psalm to the setting for the canticles, Collegium Regale for this royal foundation from the hymns to the responses. Looking to the future, the words that I chose for tonight's introit and those of the anthem caution us to be mindful of how we approach the task set before us. These texts are among a group of 15 psalms labelled Songs of Ascent, traditionally understood as intended for liturgical use by pilgrims travelling to the temple at Jerusalem. This is perhaps the most obvious in I was glad, with his expression of delight at, the, at approaching the city and anticipation of entry into the temple, a place of beauty and divine encounter, where peace and safety lie within its walls. Nisi Dominus, except the Lord build the house, is typical of these songs of ascent. In that repeated phrase, except the Lord, the poet moves upwards, constructing a cumulative argument. He describes three sorts of labour, building a house, either a family or a building, guarding a city, and anxious, obsessive toil, all of which are futile without God's direct involvement. For a new dean, with a tendency to overwork, and a poor work-life balance, this is notably sound advice. But this is not about me. Unless the Lord build the house, their labour is but lost that built it. What is the house? In a sermon on this psalm, St Augustine reminds us, the house of God, the house of Christ, is the temple of God, he wrote and quoted St Paul to the Corinthians, God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Augustine went on, this house of Christ comprises all the faithful, not only those alive today, but also our predecessors in the faith who have fallen asleep, and those who will come after us, those to be born into this human life even to the end of the world. Remember that great cloud of witnesses who are part of the very fabric of this house. In his address to those to, about to be ordained deacon in this place last Saturday, the bishop spoke to the candidates of the weight of their calling. He asserted, you cannot bear this in your own strength, 
but only by the grace and power of God. So he urged the congregation then to pray earnestly for the gift of the Holy Spirit. The weight of my calling to this charge is also too great for me to bear in my own strength. But I know that God works through human agents and that he works here through you, this congregation, this community, this great cloud of witnesses. This is not about me. It is about all of us. It is together as a community that we will go forward and continue to build this house of Christ as a temple fit for God and for all his saints. As we will sing in our final hymn, Christ is our cornerstone. On him alone we build. Let us pray. The psalmist reminds us, except the Lord build the house, their labour is but lost that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. Look upon our labours, good Lord, and strengthen them, lest they be lost. We have risen early, we have taken little rest. Our minds have long been filled with worry and care. Remember this house, which is called by the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant to its members health and peace and the renewal of their strength, as they have turned their hands anew to build this place and its future, through the same Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Job asks, where shall wisdom be found, and where is the place of understanding? O God, our Father, light of the minds that know you, and strength of those who serve you, as your word commands the winds and waters, as your wisdom stretches from one end of the earth to another, mightily and sweetly ordering all things, grant us a share in your word and wisdom, that we may serve you and your people wholeheartedly. We pray for Sarah, our Dean, for the governing body and for the cathedral chapter, for this city, university, diocese and county. In your light we see light. Shed your grace upon us for the sake of your great name. Amen. The letter to the Hebrews declares we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Eternal God, holy God, God of the saints in every time and place, help us to lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely. Give us patience and the perseverance necessary to run the race that is set before us. Inspire us by the lives and testimony of those who have laboured in this place in ages past. And until the last, remind us that Jesus Christ has gone ahead of us, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, enduring the cross, despising its shame, and taking his seat at your right hand in heaven, where you live and reign with him and the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen. At the end of this day, in gratitude and hope and expectation, let us lay before the Lord the remaining cares of our hearts in a moment of silence. We gather all these prayers and all the intentions of our hearts in the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all evermore. Amen.
Christ give you grace to grow in holiness, to deny yourselves, take up your cross, and follow him. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.